Freak Oddity Sideshow Not the most flattering words that one could be called, but once upon a time they were used to great effect when it came to advertising, especially in pro wrestling. Now, in modern times, does this strategy still hold up? Well, that's exactly what we're here to talk about, because today... A big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters, such as Cool Ass Jack and Tom Hughes. Thank all of you so much. Special attractions used to be a significant part of the professional wrestling industry, especially during its humble beginnings. The idea that a performer was just so unique that the mere act of watching them wrestle alone was worth the price of admission was fairly standard stuff. And it all tied back to wrestling's early days on the carnival circuit. Back then, wrestling itself was an attraction, alongside games, animal acts, and stunt shows. Now, I have talked about this before, but a common practice would be to have a carnival wrestler challenge anyone in the crowd to a match, betting good money that no mere local could possibly best them. But unbeknownst to the town folk, the match was actually fixed, with their local hero who would step up being set to take a dive. In order for the town folk to not get wise to the carnival stealing their money in a predetermined battle, out, the fight had to be sold well on both sides. Now ideally, the local hero would be someone that the town already knew and trusted, but on the reverse end, the carnival's wrestler would have to be someone who does look like they're capable of throwing down, yet still be someone that they wanted to bet their money against. And in which case, the carnival would make good on some of the talents they already had at their disposal, such as the strongman weightlifter with his incredible strength, or how about the amazing speed and agility of the acrobat, which makes him impossible to catch. And the freak show. Behold, the contortionist with the bendable body who can escape out of any hold. Or how about the world's tallest man whose heights cannot be reached. And let's not forget about the human pincushion with over 200 piercings throughout his body. The man is completely impervious to pain. These were just some examples of selling points and proto gimmicks that were used to draw in spectators who were interested in seeing some of these performers wrestle. And I'm willing to bet it probably worked a little bit on you. Come on, be honest, at least a small part of you was just a little curious in seeing some visuals for those examples about the freak show I gave back there. Well, curiosity aside, if you've noticed, both wrestling and sideshows have mostly dropped from the carnival scene. Even the term freak show itself has fallen out of favor, with some finding it offensive and cruel to enjoy gawking at someone just because they look different. Which begs the question, if the concept of a sideshow doesn't draw in audiences for the circus anymore, then is it also a bad idea for pro wrestling? Well, the practice has gone on longer than you might think. After moving out of the carnivals, wrestling still employed the tactic of using special attractions to sell tickets, and one of the most significant examples of this would have to be Haystack's Calhoun. Haystack's was a major draw during his career, which escapes a lot of fans today. He was such a big draw that some have even speculated that it paradoxically kept him from winning the world title. Now, most of the time, even today, being a top earner usually earns you some time with the gold. However, for sideshows, some feel that they are way better off being kept away from the title belt, with the mentality that if their drawing power comes from being a special attraction and a world champion also draws money, then combining the two might lesser your total sales. And there's also the line of thinking that sideshows don't make good world champions as their character tends to clash with the idea of being a title holder. Of course, the act of excluding special attractions from gold only works to put sideshows, well, further on the side. Even today, this line of thinking is prevalent and the reason as to why some feel that wrestlers like The Fiend really shouldn't be anywhere near the title picture in WWE. And also, Haystacks wasn't alone in this, as other wrestlers who were of similar size were also significant parts of professional wrestling's history, such as Happy Humphrey and the Maguire Twins. But it would be Yokozuna who would buck the trend, as he was both touted for his mass and also managed to become WWF World Heavyweight Champion. Although, wait! isn't the only physical feature that gets the special attraction treatment, as height is yet another selling point. WWE is even trying it now with wrestlers like Omos, and when it comes to tall wrestlers, they tend to fare better when it comes to winning gold. Sure, there were mega giants like the Giant Gonzalez and Big Cass who never won squat, but Great Khali, The Big Show, and Andre the Giant are all former champions, with The Big Show actually being a Grand Slam champion himself. Going back to Andre the Giant, the man was the first truly 
truly international megastar when it came to professional wrestling, as fans just had to see him get in the ring and they couldn't get enough of him. Plus, let's not forget that during the Attitude Era, there was a group called the Oddities, which was pretty much just a callback to this era of professional wrestling. And going beyond just weight and height, we can also consider another physical trait that might just count as a sideshow, and it's one of Vince McMahon's absolute personal favorites muscles. As we all know, the WWE has showcased numerous wrestlers for their stunning physiques. Now, don't think that physical rarities are the only types of special attractions there are, because it's really all about marketing. Take George the Animal Steel. Here was a wrestler billed as, well, an animal, when in real life he was actually a regular old teacher in his shoot job. So you see, it's really all in the presentation. Furthermore, sometimes it's not just about the physical appearance as it is about physical traits, such as Draws, who was first advertised to fans for his ability to vom on command, or even Mark Henry presented as the world's strongest man, sold off of his physical ability, originally showing off his feats of strength. And when you think about it, this makes a lot of sense. As I pointed out earlier, circus strongmen were some of the most frequent competitors used to defeat local heroes in order to swindle the marks out of their money. Also, as previously mentioned, muscle men weren't the only ones who got in on the act, as the circus did make good use of some of their other performers as well, such as acrobats. Which might just explain why, even in modern day wrestling, acrobatic feats such as flips and dives still get massive pops from the crowd. Perhaps this is because of how embedded it all is in professional wrestling's early foundation. The question is, does the special attraction still have a place in professional wrestling today? Well, I say yes. Now, granted, watching someone wrestle who's extremely tall or has an obesity issue might not be how your modern fan chooses to spend their time anymore. I mean, seeing the great Kali wasn't exactly the high point of any wrestling card, and it's not like he was bringing in loads of money either. What I'm saying is that in today's day and age, I do think that the special attraction still has a place. You just can't focus solely on the physical and nothing else. For me, I think, hearkening back to the old circus days, acrobatics, stunt shows, and other mes mesmerizing acts do have a place when it comes to bringing in crowds. The awe-inspiring high-flying of the one and only Ricochet, the might and unbelievable power of Braun Strowman. These clips are things that can go viral and become shareable on social media, making them perfect for today's fan. Highlighting physical feats rather than physical traits is where the money is, and that is exactly how I would book Braun Strowman in whatever company gets to have him. But this is not enough because today's wrestling audiences demand more. And that's why I say let's have a look at someone who might just be the greatest special attraction of all time, The Undertaker. Here we have a man who is seven feet tall, and you can't teach that. He would tightrope walk just like they do in the circus, and when he came to WWF, he was the freakiest character that the promotion had ever seen. As a result, he is one of WWE's most beloved wrestlers of all time. So in today's scene, just the fiscal isn't enough. We have to combine that with good character work and solid storylines, and of course, great matches. Even though the sideshow isn't enough on its own to draw on fans anymore, that doesn't mean that we have to completely abandon the concept, it's just evolved like anything else. So where does the sideshow belong in today's professional wrestling? Well, if done right, maybe, just maybe, it might belong right up front. Well, there you go, my thoughts on sideshows and professional wrestling, but where do you think they belong in today's wrestling? Let me know down in the comments, and please, make sure that you're subscribed to this channel, and that you give this video a big like, and that your notifications are working. And I want to thank all of my awesome Patreon supporters, and if you want to continue supporting this channel, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, Dave knows.